Hey everybody, Judy Warner here. Welcome to the On Track Podcast. I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at Altium, and this is our very first podcast. You're very brave to listen, and we're happy to have you. If you're new to On Track altogether, be sure to sign up for our On Track newsletter, which is online at resources.altium.com, or watch our On Track instructional video series, which you can find on YouTube. And our goal with on track is our tagline actually is to inspire educate and connect and by bringing you together the pcb design community um, we hope to do that so please add this podcast to your favorite rss feed or on itunes and you can also follow me personally please oh please on linkedin or at twitter at altium at altium judy and follow altium on linkedin twitter and facebook now let's get into the fun stuff. So today I thought we um, would talk about a subject that seems to be um, prevalent today in PCB design conversation, and that is about multi-board design. Uh, many designs are going as things become more complex, as we all know the automotive market, um, and so many others because of size, weight, and power, they're being uh, smaller, we're having to do rigid flex design, we're folding things upon themselves, we're fitting things into very tight spaces. So you may have just been laying out single board designs not long ago and then you find yourself entering this sort of complex world that comes with it, comes with it a lot of you know new and challenging new aspects of things you need to think about in the overall design. So a few of those things that I've learned about from my guest, Ben Jordan, is um, partitioning, uh, connection management, and signal and power integrity. So I have brought in Ben Jordan, who is our resident multi-board expert and my friend and colleague and partner in crime. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. So Ben, talk about what you see sort of currently going on in the EDA market as a whole, what's going on in Altium, and what kind of challenges specifically you see designers facing and sort of how they overcome them? Yeah, well, if you look at the PCB design and electronics or board level electronics design sort of industry over history over the last, I don't know, even four decades, the the march has always been in it. I can't see it changing any time really soon to make things smaller, cheaper, more reliable, better for production runs, and more compact. And that's really taken um, an uptick. It's To me, it, if, if I could graph complexity versus board area, I'm sure it would look something like a hockey stick, you know, up, mm -hmm. up and to the right. And... That really has always been that way. It's just that with exponential things like this, we we see it, it, it. The further to the right you go, the more acute it becomes, the issue of trying to fit more in less space. And this is partly brought on by higher levels of integration in the semiconductor side. Um, sometimes it's alleviated by that, as our guest at Altium Live recently in Munich, Lee Ritchie, aptly pointed mm -hmm. out that uh, PCB designs can in some cases get simpler and simpler because more integration on the actual microprocessor is happening. But at the same time, we're dealing with greater densities, greater pinout densities. But something that we have noticed in our industry is, is that there are many companies that were not electronics companies or that on the outside their products may not be considered primarily an electronic device. I just saw this in a magazine, um, like a whole article about electronics and beauty products. Like what? Right, We're exactly. Like a, a device you can put on your thumbnail so you know if you're going to get sunburned. And it's an electronic device. It's, it's everywhere. Like you said, it's very prevalent. Yeah, like... Wearables is actually a classic sort of prescient example of that where we, 
We no longer have mechanical watches. A mechanical watch is considered a luxury item these days and is very expensive if it is a genuine mechanical watch. Mm -hmm. Just like having a horse has become a luxury item after the automobile replaced the entire um, horse industry. And we see the same thing happen in many different sort of product realms. And so wearables is a is a good example of that. I wear a Fitbit. I love this thing. It's Me cool. too. Yours um, is cooler than mine. Though. A lot of my friends have Apple watches as well. And so electronics is replacing things that traditionally weren't. And these companies are primarily driven by product design and function, not by the engineering team having a good idea. So electronics companies in the past. And, and there's still many of them that do do this, uh, see themselves as an electronics company and the product development is driven by engineering and inventors who are electrical engineers or equivalent. But then there's this whole growth in the market that happens through furniture makers, car makers, um, that's you another name it. weird thing I saw. You name it, and they're about becoming the sofa. There's like yeah. a whole device set being embedded into a sofa. I'm like, what? And smart homes. Just yeah, think smart of all homes, the control yeah. going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so these, but a lot of these are design slash mechanically driven um, product manufacturers or designers, and and so the electronics has to fit within that and as a result PCB designers more and more are being forced to partition the design into a multi-board system. So how do you think we're doing as an EDA industry and addressing that and giving them tools that are you know easy to onboard and get up to speed quickly right they can't spend six months learning how to do really excellent the, exactly. Multi-board so design, ev- everybody, so. that's just it. Every everybody faces this multi-board challenge. But in the past, we're not the first company. We're not the first. Altium is not the first EDA company to provide a multi-board design solution. Um, but but we are the first in that range <laughs> of the market where anybody can actually afford our our tools. If they're a professional designer, they can afford Altium Designer, and it's pretty well known. And and our mission has always been to include the technology people need for everyday kind of design mm-hmm. and advanced technology for design and not withhold that just because somebody is not an enterprise customer. I mean, the enterprise has different needs around data management and workflow Management, but from an actual design and computer aided design perspective, every PCB designer should have multi board design capabilities because they all face the same problems. And so, I think this is the first time that in the mainstream we've we've seen anybody address this multi board design issue with proper connectivity management and three D modeling of the system to make sure everything's going to fit. So typically, if, you, if you're a PCB designer and you want multi-board capabilities, that's going to be, it's going to be a huge cost driver for the software at large. I'm not talking about Altium per se, but if you wanted to acquire that ability inside your EDA software, it's expensive then you're saying. Yeah, up until now, it's, it's been very high-end packages that had this capability that were we're talking maybe 10 times the licensing cost wow. but but um the i mean there's many different ways of doing it and most people out there even myself in my hobby context in my shed i've done multi-board design systems and so i realized and and altium you know we realized that it's something everybody needs, and we shouldn't withhold it and charge extra for it. It's it's just a, it is a mainstream problem, and so the technology should be available to the mainstream. So the the other way of doing it, of course, is how people are doing it up until now. If they don't have those tools, 
you have to create Excel spreadsheets or Google Sheets to maintain lists of pins on different connectors, which connector is where on the design. You have to create a hop, a high level or top level. I nearly said hop level. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking I would kill myself if I had to make spreadsheets with you pin have outs. To, I know, it's crazy. <laughs> but you have, to, you have to do this kind of stuff because if, if you think about the actual problems associated with it, there's, there's, there's a couple of different things. If you're doing a simple stacking design, you can reuse a board shape, for example. The boards will always, not always, but maybe they will be the same shape. Think of an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi that has has shields or capes or whatever that, that plug into it and they stack up vertically through the connectors. And that's that's a nice, elegant way to prototype things. Uh, but go to go to production, it's a bit tricky. And... Um, if you're if you're developing a multi-board system like that, it's fairly straightforward. But most systems are not that straightforward, and the the different PCBs within the overall product may be in different locations, different planes of orientation, and can interconnected with board-to-board -board connectors or cables and harnesses, and and then you get into issues like how do you how do you manage the pinouts? That's a big one. Connection management is a big issue with multi-board designs. Even if you're stacking one board on top of another and you have um, a header and a socket, a mating socket, most people don't even realize until this, the blue magic blue smoke is coming out of the first <laughs> prototype that, well, actually the female connector's pinout is numbered from looking top down on it. In terms of the library and the right. footprint in the library, you start yeah. traditionally pin one is at the top left and you go anti-clockwise. But that means when that connector is on the bottom side of a board plugging into another board beneath it, it's mirrored. Yeah. And this very simple thing yeah. can wreak havoc on, on the design process and time to market. So... So we needed to provide tools to prevent those kinds of problems. And I'm not a designer. I am come from the fab and EMS side. So I'm honestly asking these questions. I'm not. But doesn't the ability of our software to do 3D help with that to visually give you a sense that it's flipping instead of just sort of imagining how it's going to go it together until does. it's physically in front of you? Yeah, it's really important to have that immediate visual feedback in whatever tools you're using. And <clears throat> if if what you do is design anything, you need immediate visual feedback to get things right. And having that 3D modeling helps you align things. But the other side of this, the other area, which is probably aside from incorrect pin assignments, one of the other areas that we noted in the industry that people struggle the most with is aligning connectors and aligning components that have some kind of outward mm -hmm. expression on the actual product. So in my, I think of audio gear all the time because I'm into that, right? But mm -hmm. so one example is if I were designing a new um, amplifier, I'm going to have some potentiometers and other controls on the front panel. And so I have an enclosure, I have a, f a front panel that has markings and it has holes, and that's designed in MCAD. But the PCB assembly has to align perfectly to that. And I may actually want to realign components right. to match right. external holes and uh -huh. cutouts uh -huh. in the enclosure. Right. And, and the multi-board design uh, editor actually allows you to do that, it allows you to go into a mode where you can actually move individual components and they could be things like potentiometers or the the main intent is is connectors that have to interface with other mating connectors on other boards and you can actually cause them to snap together so that mm. on the other PCB design you you've got absolute confidence that you can make that first prototype and the connector will be in the right place and other right. components won't interfere with it yeah. in 3D space. I've seen space. some of you 
designers here in our office doing these, you know, rotating and showing, oh, if I fold this over, then this component is going to run into that part or whatever, and being able to just shift things slightly and it move kind of globally. It's it's really fun to watch. It looks almost like a computer game to me, right? Yeah. But it's really great how you can move that and, yeah. and, and see it mechanically, you know, in that 3D space instead of, uh, remember the old days of prototyping going, whoops, forgot yeah. about that. And it was completely built out. And there's yeah. all these expensive parts and you would salvage what you can, but some were just like going in the trash can. And I actually have an interesting his- bit of Altium hi- history trivia all right, about let's that. Share a trivia. Because we cool. had we had that exact issue. We, some people who've been around our orbit for a while <laughs> will, have no- will remember that we used to, do FPGA design stuff and Uh we actually had a hardware design team and their role was to design development boards for developing FPGA designs in Altium Designer and those boards were modular so we had the Nanoboard 2 is is the one I'm thinking of we had this huge motherboard and on top of that you had a daughter card that plugged right in that had that could have different FPGAs you could try from different FPGA manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And we had another three different modules you could plug into different locations on the board and each had different um, input-output options. And so during the design process of this, we ran into issues with um, 3D clearance. There were some actual problems. This is a multi-board system and back then, the only way our hardware team were able to model this was to print the the board designs that they did have and outlines out in 2D and cut those out and glue them one-to-one on bits of cardboard. I was going to say, what, cardboard. on cardboard? They would cut it all out of cardboard and glue with hot milk glue, or hot snot we call it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they'd use hot snot to glue the connectors in the positions where they would be on the final boards and plug them all together like this multi-board mock-up using right. cardboard yeah. and the actual bulky components would be on it. That's funny. And it was so time-consuming and too tempting sometimes to leave out some parts that, that should have been on that model but just due to time constraints were left off. Plus, and I remember, I'm thinking, and then the CEO walks by and thinks you're doing arts and crafts. I mean, well, I mean, I mean it was necessary, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, it, but we actually had some boards that couldn't be plugged in in their first revision and had to be revised with a different bill of materials because there was there were some power supply inductors that stuck out too far, and when the whole assembly was together, they they seriously would not fit. Oh, good Lord. So it had it's like if only we'd had this then, right? Maybe we could have reduced the cost of those product yeah. products and and so on. So so there's a lot of um, and and as I was saying earlier, I think it's inevitable that any professional designer will run into these these sorts of problems at some point. So yeah, the tools need to be provided for them. Well, I I had the rare and cool opportunity to speak to Dave Warren one time on a Skype call from Australia, one of our original founders. And I was just trying to get a sense of who the company was. And he just reminded me of like a swashbuckling pirate, like give him the tools, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like he just, he, you can tell he was so passionate about nobody should pay these, you know, crazy prices for functionality. Whoever wants them should have them by God, you know, in his Aussie accent like you. And he cracked me up, but I really, it really came through to me that he was about um, make sure that anyone who wants these tools can have them, that they're reachable. And and that, it's a fun story, by the way. That's cool. Well, that has been an undercurrent of of the whole history since the founding and to hear that straight from the horse's mouth is not at all surprising to me. I remember him sharing a similar story about when we acquired NeuroCAD in the Oh, he the told late me 90s. about that, yeah. So NeuroCAD was the first neural net-based yeah. auto-routing technology. Yeah, and he told me they were charging 118 grand for that software 
And he said, "We so we bought it and we cut the." <laughs> I'm doing like Scottish <laughs> accent now. We cut the bloody horns off it and gave it to the people. <laughs> yeah. <they laughs> so how much it, did you sell it for after that? That was three ninety five. I believe three ninety five after one hundred and eighteen grand. The com- the company that developed it sold maybe three or four licenses to to, to yeah. a few big companies. Uh huh. We acquired the technology and start immediately put the price at like three ninety five or you know under four hundred dollars, and it sold in the first month. It was over a million dollars of sales because it just people wanted it; they just couldn't afford it. That's crazy. It so, just cracked me up the way he said that. We cut the horns off and gave it to the people. Like yeah. I love that, and you could hear <laughs> the passion in his voice. He's a character. Um, well, we are out of time or running out of time, but one last thing I want to thank you, by the way, for sharing all that. Every time I oh, talk, I learn something amazing from you, Ben. Um, so on the fun side, I've always noticed, I've worked with PCB designers over 25 years plus, and something I noticed they all had in common is they have really interesting lives. I like to call it designers after hours. So, Ben Jordan, (laughs) what do you do after hours? Ooh, ooh, that sounds risque. Yeah, no, it's nothing like that. We're not going there. No, no, no. (laughs) No. (laughs) This is a G-rated podcast. I'm, I'm a very G-rated person after hours. Actually, I've always been into technology, but I'm, I'm also from. I'm the youngest of six, and from a very musical family. So, all my brothers and sisters were into music and played. Instruments and actually, the reason I'm into electronics is because of my oldest brother, Les. He, he was a great guitarist, but he was also an electronics technician and used to build his own tube amps and all sorts of cool stuff. So he gave me my first lessons in electronics That's and my fun. first lessons in guitar right around the time he he bought me my first soldering iron actually for my eighth birthday. No way. And Eight. Um, taught me there's how to nice, solder. There's a nice safe toy for your birthday. Don't get burnt. <laughs> I burnt myself on that thing many times, I and bet. I loved every minute. I bet. I'm I like, bet. this was learning, yeah. but it was. I've never looked back, and then, and then right around when I turned twelve, he bought me my first electric guitar, and I haven't looked back on that either. I mean, we just we are influenced by the world around us, but sometimes in our lives we have a kind of hero, and uh-huh. he was definitely one of my biggest heroes, and showed me. This this is this was what my life was always going to be about electronics and guitar and um, you know and now I have a family too so between between family and work and I squeeze hobby electronics and guitar in between those but it's very full and very fun. That's great. Well, it was great having you, and I'm sure we'll have you again because you are a wealth of information on lots of subjects. I know I always run over to your desk. It's like. Hey, man, I need to know something technical. So um, let's just wrap up our first podcast here. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening in on this conversation with myself and Ben Jordan. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast and remember to always stay on track. (laughs) 